Hello, I'm Ken Burrell from Pragmatic PMO. If you're a project manager and you've ever thought to yourself at the end of a project, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have done things differently, then you'll appreciate that everything seems clearer and easier with hindsight. But generating your own to hindsight is hard and often painful. George Bernard Shaw said, if history repeats itself and the unexpected always happens, how incapable man must be of learning from experience. I think that project managers can learn a lot from each other's experiences and especially from sharing their scars. Sharing experiences gives you access to somebody else's hindsight without the hard work and the pain. So as part of my campaign for real project managers, on your behalf I'm talking to some real project managers I've had the pleasure of working alongside so that you can benefit from their experience. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Martin Robbie who's going to share some of his experiences with us. Martin, I'd like you to start by introducing yourself and giving us a flavour of your background which has nothing to do with project management. <laughs> My name is Martin Robbie, um, I'm a sergeant of the Metropolitan Police Service. Um, I've been a sergeant for 21 years. Most of my career has been spent uh, around what we refer to as territorial policing, uh, right. what most people would associate as uh, the 999 response. So not really a, a project manager as such? No, certainly not. Um, uh, I always tend to be very spontaneous. Yes. Uh, a response to an incident or uh, an event which um, requires um, an emergency response um, uh, and then some kind of uh, consolidation and then a recovery phase at the end of it. So would you say that you often find yourself in a position where um, you are needing to deliver a unique service or result, so something that hasn't done before? Yes, definitely. Ag against a time constraint and a resource constraint? Hugely so. Okay, well those are the factors that are in most definitions of what a project is, Lovely. so I think yeah. um, there's a lot of, probably a lot of crossover, crossover. between yeah. what you do and what project managers, uh, what project managers need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looking back over your experience within the within the police service um, can you think of a, a, a scar or something that went wrong that you'd like to share with us and what you learned from it we'd received a 999 call from a building contractor and uh, the 999 call that came to um, the control room which um, I was the supervisor responsible for uh, was they'd found an unexploded World War II um, bomb we do quite often get these, uh, they turn out to be either non-viable or not actually bombs. So I went down there in a quite cynical viewpoint. Uh, we have a team of officers that work in the Metropolitan Police uh, that uh, their sole duty is to deal with um, uh, disposal of ordnance. Right. So I requested one of uh, their officers, well, to a pair of their officers to come out uh, and when he arrived came back uh, very shortly later uh, with the assessment that it was in fact a World War II uh, bomb. Wow. Uh, a, an estimate uh, sort of weight of excess of 500 kilos and he requested uh, the uh, British Army to attend. The location of the bomb that had uh, been discovered uh, was in uh, an area of uh, Kilburn in northwest London and the order of the evacuations would uh, massively impact on uh, both road and rail schools nearby uh, a lot of residential premises and this all had to be evacuated uh, to a safe distance. One of the principal uh, issues we would then have is if we implemented the, 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 the maximum closures uh, we would have potentially brought most of North West London to a halt. So several stakeholders then in that Hugely situation amount, with yes. um, conflicting interests maybe, conflicting views Hugely and between so. those parties you mm. had to come up with some kind of it's compromise and yeah, negotiation. Some, some kind of agreement as to where to set the cord of. Right. Hugely so. So to recap then, we've, yeah. got, a, we've got a large bomb yeah. in a hole in the ground. Essentially, yes. We've got the fire service, presumably ambulance service on standby? Correct. Bomb disposal um, unit was called out but they had to travel um, from uh, garrison a long distance away. Uh, again another thing that had to be coordinated organising their escort because um, they didn't just come down in one lorry, they arrived in I believe it was about five or six uh, lorries. They also brought along uh, Royal Engineers right. who uh, built a wall mm -hmm. uh, essentially around the, the bomb, but to, to bring in that quantity of heavy goods units into the centre of London in one controlled manner was another matter that needed coordinating. So, in a full blue light escort cordon, um, swept them into central London. One of the things I was saying about the, uh, the building the walls, uh, they were going to use um, essentially sand to fill these blocks. I believe it was in the order of 30 um, tip trucks uh, wow. brought the sand down and they used those to build essentially the blast wall around the right. the, uh, the, 
anything. But that was then having to work with the local authority who were massive partners in amongst all this. They organised that. They were organising places like um, survival reception centres for the people who had been evacuated. There was a lot of negotiation about what we were going to do with the bomb. Yeah. But this was deemed not suitable to be dealt with on site. Uh, so that then had to be removed onto essentially the back of a huge British Army low loader uh, and again with the assistance of traffic officers was escorted to a beach um, I believe out in Sussex. Um, somebody filmed the blast going off from over a mile away uh, and the blast is that big that you'd think it had gone off beside you. I say nobody was hurt uh, and it was a very successful thing but for four days we caused massive impact uh, to London yeah. uh, with the initial response, the managing of it and then the um, conciliation and collapsing everything down and getting everybody out. The principal learning from it I had was uh, just trying to manage people's expectations and um, working with partner agencies that we don't normally deal with um, and trying to grasp that their uh, their needs are as important to them as the, the needs I have to me. You, know, you, you set an aim, you set an objective, but you rarely achieve all of your objectives. It's it's, it's identif identifying almost the you know what there are must-haves, what there are would like to have, and what there are well they'd be nice if we could have them sort yep. of things, and just prioritising those and trying to find those common ground and reaching that point where everybody's going to. Um, get to the end of it and be pleased with the outcome. So in a situation like that where you've got a group of people who have never worked together before, no. they've got this direly pressing situation facing them, yeah. how do you keep everybody informed of the situation? They have a command vehicle, uh, it's essentially a large lorry truck mm -hmm. that's set out and it has a full briefing room and computers and everything in there uh, and we schedule regular meetings. Um, we also work uh, within the emergency services to um, sort of a, a command structure. It doesn't necessarily relate to rank, uh, but quite often to a person's um, particular skills or abilities. Uh, we refer to the gold, silver, and bronze mm -hmm. command structure. Gold will always be there. Will always ever be one gold. He will set um, the strategy, how he intends things to be essentially achieved, and w what is the, the, the ultimate end goal. And then you'll have a silver who will set uh, your uh, sort of your tactics. How are you going to make the strategy happen? What what is your uh, purposes? And there'll only be one silver. And then you have a multitude of bronzes. Um, so it's a case of identifying who are the the key stakeholders, who are the ones that we need, who are the ones mm -hmm. that are going to uh, achieve this. Uh, and by having your regular meetings, you can get um, some sort of a way of sort of achieving this. Uh, everybody works on slightly different uh, vocabulary and nomenclature, uh, which can create a lot mm -hmm. of confusion. Uh, people can ask or mention one thing, expecting another, uh, and things get lost in translation, which is why the face-to-face -face meetings are so much better. But you can run the risk, if you're not careful, of bringing the operation to a halt, because you're always having to halt operations to have another meeting. Lots of people like to know what's happening mm -hmm. right here, right now. And there can be a lot of criticism if you don't have mm -hmm. answers for them straight away. Um, social media has become a massive driver in this, but it can also be a massive friend. Um, particularly if you can get um, sort of uh, media um, working with you, you can then sort of get better responses when you then ask for something or essentially demand something. We'll always carry out debriefs uh, at the end of any scenario like this. We've got hot debriefs mm -hmm. uh, where they're done pretty much there and then uh, and they can be done throughout the, this, the, the event but certainly at the end of the incident there'll also be some kind of uh, sort of hot debrief where hopefully you can pull together any operational learning um, and see if there's something that can be done or prepared better next time. Uh, there's a sort of quite sort of clear defined priority list uh, particularly for emergency service workers where your, your principal and overriding theme will always be uh, to save life and limb and protect property. Um, but unfortunately, when you start bringing into external um, companies and everything like that, they then have to start factoring in um, costs and overheads right. and things like that. So probably the biggest I issue I would have and uh, as ha I've had recently 
uh, generically is uh, the, the managing of expectations of um, sort of partners uh, and being able to resource um, incidents successfully and safely um, and tr trying to comply with things like health and safety um, while trying to achieve the, the end result in a, a timely and uh, appropriate fashion uh, and trying to do the right thing for the right people for the right reasons. Martin, thanks for your time and your insights. So today we've heard from Martin about a situation he faced in the emergency services and what he learned from it. Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself but often it rhymes. To me that means that although the future is not exactly like the past, it's often similar enough for the lessons of the past to be useful. And there's often stuff that we can learn from different industries. What can you learn from Martin's emergency services experience that you can apply in your projects? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this interview, let me know by leaving a comment or a like or both, or by sharing it with others on social media. If enough people think these interviews are useful, I'll make more of them. If you want to share your scars in one, let me know. For other videos on project management topics, take a look at my video channel. For articles on project management and PMO topics, visit my website pragmaticpmo.com or follow me on Twitter at PragmaticPMO. To connect with me more personally, search LinkedIn for Ken Burrell Pragmatic PMO. In the meantime, until the next time, thanks for listening.